In my last video, I showed an experiment to repair a dented fret on my SG. That technique worked, but was really more of an emergency quick fix, and I didn't expect the results to be permanent. So I discussed the options with a local luthier. I had been thinking that I might be able to have him completely replace that damaged fret, but he said that it wouldn't be necessary and I should just do a total fret level crown and polish instead. The dent really wasn't that much deeper than a typical worn fret. It just seemed so much worse because of those sharp edges. And he said the process of leveling the frets would lower all the frets by a few thousandths of an inch and clean up the dent along with any other fret wear. If he had replaced that one fret, he would have had to do the entire leveling process anyway, and it would be a lot more difficult and expensive. So since this SG was kind of becoming a project guitar, I figured I'd go ahead and do the whole process myself, leveling, crowning, and polishing the frets, plus an overall neck tune-up. I've done all this a few times on other guitars with good results, but I don't claim to be an expert. I'm just a DIY guy. I'll show you my approach, and hopefully this will give you the confidence to try it too. But all the usual warnings, you can totally ruin your guitar if you screw this up. So experiment on a project guitar, and leave your top shelf collector's pieces to a professional luthier. There are a few tools you'll need. A straight edge, or even better, a notched straight edge matching your neck scale length. This one has both 24 and 3 quarters and 25 and a half inch scale lengths. You'll use these along with your truss rod wrench for straightening out the neck before starting. You'll need a perfectly flat fret leveling bar. I made this one on my jointer out of hard maple, but you can buy one for $50 or so. You'll need some sandpaper. I have both 220 and 320 grits here. And you'll need a couple of fret files. This is a fret crowning file and a fret end dressing file. You'll need a wide tipped black marker for marking the frets. And a fret rocker tool like this can be handy for checking if adjacent frets are level. Various sizes of blue painter's tape for taping off the fretboard. And for polishing, quadruple zero super fine steel wool is good. You may also want to use a polishing attachment for a cordless drill and some polishing compound. When it's all done, you'll want some fretboard oil and a capo and some feeler gauges can come in handy for setting the action. All right, let's get started. The first step is to remove the strings. As a shortcut, I'm just going to cut the strings off with wire cutters, but it's important for safety to loosen the strings first. Don't cut the strings while they're still under tension or you could lose an eye. Once the strings are out of the way, I remove the truss rod cover. And then I use a straight edge or a notched straight edge to ensure that the neck is perfectly flat. I make small adjustments with the truss rod wrench while looking across the fretboard at a low angle. It can be helpful to have a light on behind the neck so you can see when the gap between the straight edge and the fretboard and the frets closes up evenly across the whole fretboard. This is my homemade fret leveling bar. It's hard maple, about 16 inches long, and jointed on both sides to be perfectly flat. I cut sandpaper into strips and attach it with this 3M Super 77 spray. I put 220 grit on one side and 320 grit on the other. Fresh sandpaper cuts really well and it can be a good idea to replace the strips once or twice during the leveling process. So I'll quickly show you how I do it. Since the sandpaper page size is shorter than my 16 inch leveling bar, I have to cut two pieces to fit. I overlap them and then use a straight edge to cut across that overlap so that then I can butt the two pieces up against each other for a seamless fit. I shake up the Super 77 and spray it onto the back of the sandpaper. It doesn't take much, just a couple light sprays. You don't want to soak the paper. And to save some trouble for your next spray, be sure to clear out the spray tube when you're done by turning the can upside down until it sprays clear, and then wipe off the nozzle. Then before the Super 77 completely dries, I attach it to the leveling bar. I line up the seam and then press it down firmly. And then I come back with some scissors to cut off the excess overhang. And before starting the sanding, I use a wide tip black marker to mark the frets to help gauge my progress while leveling and point out low and high spots. But to avoid getting ink on the fretboard, it's a good idea to lay down some painter's tape first. It can be helpful and save time to have several sizes of tape for the different fret spacing. But if you have just one size, you can use multiple strips of tape for the wider fret spacing, and then cut the tape with scissors for the higher frets. Now painter's tape isn't super tacky, which is good because it'll be easy to remove later and it won't damage the wood. But the oils on the fretboard will prevent the tape from sticking well. So it's helpful to cut the tape a little longer than the width of the fretboard, 
and wrap it around the back of the neck so it'll stay in place. This is a pretty laborious process, so let's skip ahead a little bit. And because I'll be sanding and filing the frets, little pieces of metal are going to be floating around and will have a tendency to stick to the magnets of the pickups. So I'm also going to tape over the humbuckers with painter's tape to protect them. And now, finally, I'm ready to come back with my black pen and completely cover the top of each fret with ink. Now one final check with the straight edge to confirm the fretboard is still flat, and then it's time to level the frets. I've marked the end of my leveling bar in pencil to indicate which side is 220 and which is 320, and I'll start with the rougher 220 grit. Now using a mixture of straight back and forth and oval motions, I try to ensure that I'm covering all the frets equally. Yeah, I've just realized that I bumped the nut, and I should probably cover that with painter's tape too. Okay, back to work. I'm still using the 220 grit side of the leveling bar. And you can't really see because of the camera angle, but the length of the leveling bar is actually hitting all 24 frets as I'm gliding back and forth. Now I stop periodically to check progress. I'm looking to see that all the ink has been removed from all the frets. I'm not pushing down with much force. I'm just using the weight of the leveling bar itself. Don't want to be too aggressive. It's better to take it slow and easy. The frets conform to the fretboard radius, and I want to maintain that radius as I evenly remove just a bit of material from all the frets. So I'm paying attention to ensure even coverage. I don't want to spend too long in any one area, or neglect any area. Quick check with a fingernail over that damaged fret to see how we're doing, and then also looking for areas of black ink which indicate low spots on the frets. There's a spot up there at the 24th fret and a couple other places. So we'll need to come back with the leveling bar to do some more sanding. Basically, if there are still low spots on any fret, then all the other frets need to be sanded down a bit further. This requires quite a bit of patience and elbow grease, but after a lot more sanding and periodic progress checks, the black ink will eventually be gone. Then it's time to check our work with the fret rocker tool. This oddly shaped little tool is designed with four different lengths of straight edge, just the right size for checking fret level at different fret spacings along the fretboard. You place the rocker edge spanning three frets and give it a wiggle, and if you hear it clicking while rocking, then you know the frets aren't exactly level. So that clicking sound is indicating we have more work to do. So more sanding, and I periodically check with the fret rocker across the whole fretboard. Once it's all level, it's time to switch to a higher grit. It's a good idea to repeat the process of marking the frets with ink, and then flip the leveling bar over to the 320 grit side, and back to more sanding. This won't take as long as the previous sanding, since the frets are already leveled. We're really just smoothing out the scratches left by the 220 grit sandpaper. All this work sanding has flattened the top of the frets, so we'll need to use a crowning file to restore their rounded shape. I'm using this medium-wide, double-edged fret file, and I'll use a fair amount of downward pressure, keeping the crowning file parallel with the fret. This is another pretty laborious step. It'll require a bit of patience and elbow grease. But it's important to spend enough time on each fret, and periodically check your progress, and go back over any frets that need extra work. After crowning the frets, there can be some sharp edges at the fret ends. I accidentally turned off the camera for this step, but I used a fret end dressing file to knock off any sharp corners. Next, I'll start polishing off any tool marks with some 320 grit sandpaper. I just cut off a piece to fit my finger, and then I spend a bit of time on each fret. You'll find that you can actually feel your progress through the sandpaper in eliminating any roughness. You can see there's a bit of a meditative component to this effort, as you iterate over all of the frets multiple times in such painstaking detail. 
After the 320 grit sandpaper, the next polishing step is this quadruple zero super fine steel wool. And once again, I give all of the frets some attention, probably spending about 30 seconds per fret. This video is sped up 3000%, but 30 seconds times 24 frets is at least 10 or 15 minutes per pass. If you're not sweating by this point, you're not working hard enough. Okay, all this filing, sanding, and polishing has produced a lot of metal dust. Let's vacuum that up now before the final polishing. Now I'll use this simple buffing wheel attached to a cordless drill and this black emery compound stick, which should be effective at removing any remaining scratches and producing a nice smooth shine. I'm just rubbing some compound onto each fret to give it something to work with, but this isn't very scientific. At some point, there will be enough compound on the buffing wheel itself. And then I come back with the cordless drill and buff each fret, moving back and forth across the entire fret until it looks clean and feels smooth to touch. Let's hit the 3000 speed time machine again and get through this. Honestly, at this point in the project, I'm exhausted. It's been a multi-hour, labor-intensive effort. But the end is finally in sight. Okay, the frets are looking good, and it's finally time to take all this blue tape off. The blue painter's tape is really good at not leaving any sticky residue on the fretboard. Nevertheless, it's a good idea to use some oil to clean and restore the fretboard after removing the tape. I use premium bore oil, which is usually used for woodwind instruments, but it works great on fretboards too. I apply a few drops at each fret, and then come back with a paper towel and massage it into the wood. I find this really satisfying. The oiled wood has such a beautiful color. Using a white paper towel makes it easy to see your progress. You can see this fretboard isn't too dirty. I make sure the wood is nice and saturated with oil, and then I fold over the paper towel to a clean dry section and wipe off any excess. Looking good. Flipping over the guitar, you can see that there's some tape residue stuck on the back of the neck. So I'm just using the blue tape itself to remove whatever's left. This glossy neck has always seemed sticky to me, and it actually affects my playing. I feel like my hand gets stuck on the back of the neck sometimes, especially at a sweaty gig. So bonus tip, you can use some steel wool or a sanding pad to rub out some of the glossiness from the back of the neck for a beautifully smooth satin feel. I'm going to go with the sanding pad because it's not as messy as the steel wool. And I'm simply going to work across the back of the neck, making sure to get full even coverage. And you'll see a little bit of white powdery residue coming off the neck, and that's just some of the glossy finish being removed. Note that we're not intending to cut all the way through that finish, just to rough it up a little bit. Might as well give the body a bit of a cleaning too before reassembly. I'm just using some instrument polish. And 3000% speed makes quick work of the job. Now, after having installed a new set of strings, it's time to adjust the action. I start with the high E, checking at the 17th fret with my feeler gauge set to just under 1 16th of an inch, around 0 0.06 inches. I hold the gauge under the strings without fretting, and then adjust the height using the bridge screws until the string just touches the gauge. Then I set up a new feeler gauge stack for the low strings at about 5 64ths of an inch, or 0 0.08 inches. And then repeat the process of adjusting the height at the 17th fret. Now with the string height roughed in, it's time to adjust the truss rod for relief. I use a capo at the first fret and then hold the string down at the highest fret, checking the spacing with my feeler gauge at the 7th fret. I'm looking for a space of about 5 thousandths and just make small adjustments to the truss rod as necessary to get it there. Of course, all of these string height measurements really depend on the guitar and your playing style. It's really a personal preference, and you'll need to experiment a bit to find what works best for you and your guitar. Now once the relief is dialed in, it's worth doing a quick check back at the 17th fret to see if any further bridge height adjustments are needed. And this looks okay, so the final step is to tune it up and to do some intonation. 
You'll want a fairly accurate tuner for this. I'm using a Planet Waves True Strobe tuner, which is accurate to one tenth of a cent. The line rotates clockwise when sharp and counterclockwise when flat. I start by tuning the string open, and then I compare the harmonic at the 12th fret with the note fretted at the 12th fret. We're trying to make sure that the 12th fret is precisely halfway along the length of the string between the nut and the bridge saddle. If the fretted note is flat relative to the harmonic, it means that the length of string between the fret and the saddle is longer than the length of string between the fret and the nut, so we need to move the saddle closer to the fret to make it shorter. I use a small flathead screwdriver to rotate the saddle adjustment screw. It's important to use a screwdriver that's the right size so that you don't damage the screw head. As you turn the screw, you'll see the saddle moving forward or back. Just do a small adjustment and then recheck the intonation. Also note, it's important when checking the fretted tuning not to press too hard on the string, or your measurements will be sharp. So you can see this fretted note is still just a little bit flat relative to the harmonic. So I'm going to make one more minor adjustment. And it can be helpful to give the saddle a wiggle in its slot to ensure that it's seated properly after adjusting the screw. Sometimes it seems like they can get a little stuck under the tension of the string. So just checking this again, and it's still a little flat, so one more adjustment. And again, I'm going to pull the string and give the saddle a nudge to make sure it's in place. So there we go. That looks good. And the procedure is the same for every string. And once you've done them all, the guitar should play nicely in tune across the entire fretboard. To recap, when comparing the fretted note to the harmonic, if the fretted note is lower or flatter than the harmonic, you want to move the saddle closer to the nut to make the string shorter. But if the fretted note is higher or sharp relative to the harmonic, you want to move the saddle away from the nut towards the tail of the guitar to make the string longer. If you find that you've moved the saddle all the way back and it's still sharp, this often happens on the G string for some reason, you can sometimes disassemble the bridge and rotate the saddle 180 degrees which, because of the angle of the saddle head, will move the contact point back another sixteenth of an inch or so. And if that's not enough, then you can buy a different type of bridge with a longer throw for the intonation screws. The Nashville-style tunematics are a common replacement for the traditional tunematic. If you still can't get the strings to intonate, you could try a different set of strings, different string gauge, or, worst case, you may have to move the entire bridge by filling and redrilling the holes for the bridge posts. But that's a much bigger undertaking, and hopefully you don't have to go there. After intonating, the final step is to stretch out the strings so they stay in tune. I do a series of stretches and bends on each string, including behind the nut, and I repeat this process until the strings no longer go flat after stretching. And when we're done, the guitar is in tune, and it'll stay in tune. Well, I'm really pleased with how it all turned out. The frets feel glassy smooth. That dent is completely gone, of course. I had been a little bit worried about taking off too much, but there's plenty of life left in these frets. The back of the neck feels silky smooth, and overall it just plays great. I hope this has been helpful, and thanks for watching. For more information on this and other projects, visit my blog at planetz.com and at Facebook slash John Planet Z.